I'd just like to introduce to you the, uh, the amazing Tim Clark, who is the senior pastor of Peel Street Church of Christ. Oh, thank you, Mark. Yes, put your hands together for Tim. Um, Tim, uh, uh, first I just want to say a huge big thank you. you uh, Tim led the team that pulled together the unearthed event at the Civic Hall uh, last Thursday night and it was just an amazing time. Tim, can you just tell us maybe a couple of highlights from Thursday night yeah, for you? Yeah, definitely. Oh, well, thanks for being here. Great to be here today. Um, look, we had uh, over 549 registrations. We reckon around about 500 people attending, which is amazing for the first time that we've done a church-wide, city-wide event. And we know definitely of four people who came to faith for the first time. Uh, there's probably about another 34 people who recommitted their lives to Jesus and uh, just a lot of people wanting to do the Faith Runs Deep course as well as connect with other people within church. So it's just wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, and I, I was trying to think uh, the last time there was a big combined churches event like that, it it's would be at least 20 years. A long time ago. Yeah, people yeah, were talking so. about the Bill, Na Bill Newman Crusade yes, sort of days. Yeah, yeah, that would be um, So would be very it. exciting. To, and what can happen in the future too, looking yeah. forward to that. Yeah, fantastic. Now, Tim's here because... We're doing this funny thing today. It's sort of like a simulcast. It is. So tell us a little bit about what's happening there. So what's uh, happening now is uh, we're going to introduce Carl and uh, he's going to preach for you here today at uh, this service, but then we're going to record it and play it at Peel Street at our 10.30 service. So for those at Peel Street, great to have you here today and uh, <laughs> looking forward to hearing Carl. <laughs> That's going to be absolutely fantastic. And look, it is an absolutely, uh, absolute delight to have Carl Faze here with us uh, this morning. Carl's the CEO of uh, Olive Tree Media, uh, the uh, organisation uh, behind uh, the whole vision for Unearthed and for Faith Runs Deep, uh, which is the preaching series and uh, small group series that we're doing here in our church. Uh, over the next few weeks, and I think it's the same for you guys, Yeah, same Tim. at Peel Street, and there's a whole bunch of churches around Ballarat doing the same course and the same series, which is exciting. Yeah, so Carl's the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, inspiration behind <laughs> all of that, uh, a, a guest uh, speaker um, in demand all around Australia, a fantastic communicator with a heart to encourage and inspire and to share the gospel. So can we put our hands together for Definitely. Carl as he makes his way forward? Uh, that's fantastic. Thank Thanks, Tim. Thank Thanks for so you yeah. finished saying hello to each other. Short conversation. Now, it is really good to be in Ballarat, it's, uh, it, and it's been great to be sharing with Tim and Mark and the team, and the teams of churches are around the city of Ballarat. It's really exciting for us. If you haven't been here for the last few weeks, and perhaps this is a, a week that you've turned up the church and wondering what's going on, and you're wondering what Faith Runs Deep is or what it stands for, uh, Faith Runs Deep is a, a, a course. Uh, well, it's not. It's a course. It's a series, and it's a series that's sort of designed. You, you could watch as a, a a television type show but it's actually great for small groups and that's where it's used most across Australia. It's been on Australian Christian Channel, it's been on uh, Shine TV in New Zealand but our, our great passion is that churches like you would use it. For those of you who can still remember a DVD player, do you remember those DVD players? Uh, hardly anybody can find one to save themselves these days but if you do, there are, it is available as a DVD. Many of you will do this and there's study guides available and uh, the church will have them but if you think, if you like paper study guides, uh, they're available available uh, that you can grab today. The, the, all of this is streamed. So for those of you who like streaming, uh, you can go to our Watch Plus platform on olivetreemedia.com.au and on the Watch Plus platform you can stream not just this series, you can stream every series we've created and there's, a, there's about six different series that are on that Watch Plus platform. But the other thing which is a bit different is this anthology. When we did the series we, we interviewed about 40, more than 40 people and uh, we, could, we cut them down and they're, they're all cut into the 12 episodes, but mostly they're quite shortened. And we want to do a, a longer piece. So there's 24 stories here. Some of them are historic. Others are actually, you know, many of them are stories from today, people's lives today. And here's their stories, the anthology uh, of the series, Faith Runs Deep. And that's, that's available today. So if, you can, if, if they're helpful for you, great. If they're not, that's fine as well. But we want to just let you know that they're available this morning. I watched uh, the end of, well, I saw clips of the end of the Anzac Day, uh, MCG, Collingwood versus Essendon. Go Clearly a Collingwood supporter. You would be a popular person in this room, wouldn't you? Potentially, potentially. 
They say, I, I see a hand. I see a hand. I mean, it's, I feel like an evangelist right now. Um, there's at least two Collingwood supporters. That, that was a remarkable match. For those of you who saw, them, saw it or saw, saw the clips, 95,000 people at the MCG. Collingwood comes from 28... I shouldn't bang on about Collingwood, should I? But they came down from 20, 28 points down, win the match. All fabulous. And yet, so why am I mentioning this? Because of what happened after the match. Uh, uh, Darcy Moore, who's the... Ca- a youngish guy, captain of Collingwood, stamps up to the microphone at the end of the match on Anzac Day and does this most remarkable speech. And many of you might have seen clips of this. I didn't watch the match. I know that's a great surprise to you. I didn't watch the match, but I saw the... I, I heard about the, the, this speech. I went to the, to the clip and watched this, this short speech that he gave. And for those of you who don't know, it's Anzac Day... This young guy, the Collingwood captain, uh, he's, he's a footballer uh, and there is some connection, no, not necessarily a connection between footballers and academic excellence. Let's just leave it at that. And, uh, and he, gets, he does this speech and there's, like, there's, there's a th- several parts of the speech. One is he be- began to thank and mention all of the, the men and women serving our country uh, at home and abroad. Then he went on another piece and said to the veterans, over 600,000 veterans in this country have returned. We want to extend our thanks for your sacrifice and service. And then he said this. I'm going to read this last paragraph. He said, and finally to the families of those serving and to those veterans, too often your stories go untold. On behalf of the Collingwood Footy Club, not particularly interested in the Essendon Football Club, but in behalf of the Collingwood Football Club, we just want to acknowledge the pain of war that runs through so many families across this this country. It is an honour for us to run out here and play our game in honour of you and your service. So to the families of those who have served, we thank you very much. Now, that is a remarkable statement. And there's a few, there's a few levels to that statement, but, but what's going on here? It's about story and memory. I can remember being a kid a long time ago and kind of getting out of my teenage years into my 20s and, and Anzac Day would roll around each year and I remember thinking, I wonder how long this will last for. You know, there's the last serviceman from the Second World War dying off. There's a, there's a fairly negative perception within the community to the, to, to the Vietnam, Vietnam War. I, I just felt as, as a, a younger a person, a younger adult, that this thing will just die out. It's not even close to dying out, is it? It's this massive thing that gets bigger every year. And what happens every year? We tell stories. And the incredible thing that, that um, Darcy Moore has done is he has I'm, I'm sure he looked up these stats. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sure this is not just on the top of his mind. And there's probably people who helped him write this. But there's all this information that he knows, the stories that have been told. Anzac Day is not just about celebrating war. It's about telling stories. And in this series, Faith Runs Deep, there's an example of why stories matter. Stories are important. We say that in the trailer to the series, and I say this when I talk about the series a great deal. Stories matter a great deal. And when you think about it, when you get together as a family, what do you do? Well, you don't necessarily have esoteric discussions about the important political issues of the day. Some of you will. You don't do that so much, do you? You tell stories. What happened last week? What happened last year? In fact, at Christmas, you get together... And you tell stories over lunch and uh, over dinner or the time you're together. And the crazy thing is, you know what you do? You tell the same stories as you told last year and the year before. Then nobody says, seriously, Grandma, I mean, do we have to hear that again? Or maybe you do because you're unkind. But there's this notion that why, why do you do that? Because they are who you are as a people. And what you do as a family or what you do as a group of friends, I just went away playing golf with a group of my mates last weekend. And when we get together, we've been doing this, this for like, there's 12 of us that sort of changed over the years, but some of us have been doing this for like more than 15 years. And when we get together and have this golfing game and we talk about the game and, and we sit around a table, what do we also tell? All the crazy stories of what have gone on for the last 15 years. And we, we, we know we told those stories last year. Nobody says, oh, you told that story last year. We all laugh. We, it's just fantastic because stories make a difference. And actually, the important thing about stories is they're not just entertainment, are they? What is Darcy Moore doing here? He's passing on values. 
It's the values of Anzac Day. It's the values of service. It's the values of sacrifice. It's the values of gratitude. And you tell stories in your family because they pass on values. You know, there are certain stories you'll turn up to a family gathering and a story comes to mind and you think, not going near that story. Why? Because it's not the values of the family. And you know it doesn't work. The interesting thing is, what we do as families, we do as churches, we do as communities, and we do as nations. And if you think about it, if I say this, and I've, t- I've said this quite a bit, what are the stories they tell about the Christian church in the last 20 years? And we all know they're not great stories, are they? And here I am in Ballarat, and you are more aware than anybody else around this country that they're painful stories. And, and the trouble is we're losing the stories of faith that made a difference in this nation. There's a, there's a book by a guy called Rod Dreyer, and it's called Live Not By Lies. The point I'm about to make is not actually the point of the book, but he goes on to say this. He said, in Poland, in the, at the end of the, in the Second World War, when the Nazis took over Poland, they didn't want to just take over Poland and, and run the place, which they did, because militarily they were much more powerful. They wanted to take away what it meant to be Polish. So what did they do? They took away their stories and they took away their religion. That's what they were trying to do. It wasn't so much that they dominated them politically or militarily. They wanted to dominate them culturally. And the way you dominate a people culturally is to take away their stories, to dominate what they think about, what they talk about and what they can interact on. It's interesting that that is not a modern phenomena. If you've got your Bible, you might want to find Judges chapter 2. For those of you who are not sure, Judges is very close to the beginning, as you can see from my Bible. And Judges is an important book because it's called the Judges because Judges started to rule over Israel. You know that the long story is the people of Israel, God's people, the, the children of Abraham, the people that God set aside end up in Egypt. That was good for a while, then they're dominated, they're treated as, as slaves, as servants for the people. Uh, they're, they're killing their children. And, and God raises up Moses in a really remarkable way to lead the, the Israelites out of, the, out of Egypt to the Promised Land. Red Sea, get out into the wilderness. You know that most of you will know they're in the wilderness for 40 years. Finally, they're going to go into the Promised Land. They're going to cross the, the Jordan into the Promised Land. And we know that Moses finishes his role and, and uh, Joshua takes up the role of leadership. And there's a book called Joshua, which talks about them taking over the land. And then in Judges chapter 2, it starts off with really good news. In verse 6 of Judges chapter 2, after Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they were to take possession of the land each their, to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him and all who had seen the great things that God had done for all of Israel. So this, this looks like a great moment, doesn't it? They've won the battle. They've, they've taken hold of what God has promised them. They're in the promised land. Joshua is now relaxed. The elders and all the people, they know all that God has done. It's looking fantastic for the future. Here is this wonderful, wonderful picture. And yet that changes radically. Verse 10, after the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who, neither knew, who, who knew neither the Lord or what he had done for Israel. They didn't know this story. They had no idea of what had passed. They, 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 were, they were basically ignorant. And when the whole generation before them passed away, These people neither knew the Lord nor what the Lord had done. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods and peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger. What happens is... They forget the story. They have no idea of their heritage, no idea of their story. And it's not that they kind of then live in a vacuum with no religion and no faith. What they do is they then take on the faith of the people around them. 
Stories matter. History matters. Passing on stories matter. And the intriguing thing is, when they lose their story and they lose their faith and they lose their history, they take on the religion of the people around them. Now, you might be thinking, well, that happened in those days. That wouldn't happen now. We live in a godless country where people don't believe you know, around us in places like Victoria and New South Wales, Melbourne, Sydney, uh, country towns like Ballarat or Toowoomba or Bathurst. They're moving away from the things of God and they're just becoming kind of basically secular. That's not necessarily true, actually. Because when they lose the faith of our nation, that, that built our nation, I'm not saying we were always a Christian nation, but Christianity was a, a, a key foundational idea in our nation. When they lose that, what they don't, it's not that they can't take up nothing, they take up all the religions around them. And if you're thinking, well, maybe Buddhism and Hinduism is growing, no. Here's Michael Bird. He's uh, from Ridley College in Melbourne, and he's written a book a, a, about uh, religious freedom in, a secular, in an age of secularism. And here's what he said about, what, about the religions of today. Marvel superheroes replace the saints. Sports stadiums replace cathedrals. Technologists are the new prophets. Activists, the new priests. The absence of God does not lead to an absence of worship. Quite the opposite. People have become more driven to worship, but what they worship is what satisfies their desires, irrespective of those desires, and are endowed with virtue or full of villainy. What is he saying? We have a new set of gods, a new set of prophets, a new set of beliefs, a new set of values, and that's the religion of our day. One that, what we are responding to is a clash of religions. So what do we do? And I've got a couple of things for, that we should be doing and a couple of things that I believe that you should be considering. And the first is this, know and tell the stories of our nation. That's what we need to do. That's the motivation of Faith Runs Deep. That's the motivation of helping our nation and our people recapture our history. It's not making up a history and projecting it on the past. It is recognising the things of God within our nation. And that's true from the beginning. If you were there on Thursday night, I spoke about some of the, some of the, the examples out of our history. If you weren't there Thursday night, let me just remind you that what we see in our nation is from our early leadership from our politics, in our social services, in sport and in business, there are key leaders in all of those areas that were people of faith that actually motivated and directed what they did. Let me give you one example this morning. Looking at the time, Peel Street, I'm not going to go all day. You, I'm not going to go all day. That's a great encouragement to all of you. Let me give you one example. We want to do politics. And, and I thought when we were starting to plan this, I guess we'll find people on the conservative side of the political spectrum, the National Party, the Liberal Party, etc. I wonder whether we'll find, you know, maybe we'll be able to find somebody on the Labor side. That would be good. I could not have been more wrong. You know that the Labor movement and the Labor Party, up until about the 1940s, was absolutely dominated by Protestant Christian leaders. And one of my great uh, heroes that's become a hero for me, having done this series, is a guy called W.G. Spence. W.G. Spence came from not far from here, uh, and uh, the Wimmera area. W.G. Spence started the, the Shearer's Party. He started the Miners' Union. The, 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 sorry, the Shearer's Union, the Miners' Union. He started the AWU. He then went on to be a key leader in the beginning of the Labor movement in Australia. Paul Rowe, who we interviewed about W.G. Spence, I said to him, what did, what did W.G. G. Spence see in the Bible that led him to be a union leader? He said he believed that on a Sunday, the church's role was to support, and he, he uses this as sexist, but he uses the word men, because basically men was the key driving force in, in the labour movement. He, the church's role is to support men, but the rest of the week, the union's role is to stand with men and look after them. He was motivated by the person of Jesus. In fact, there's another person we talked to, Roy Williams, who used three examples. And three examples was Andrew Fisher, W.G. Spence, 
And the guy whose name escapes him because he's not on my notes. And he said, what do these three men have in common? One was the first Labor Premier of New South Wales. Andrew Fisher was the Prime Minister of Australia on three occasions, came from Queensland, was in the Miners' Union. And W.G. Spencer, I just told, told you about. He said, what, what do those three men have in common before they went into politics? Each of them was the Sunday school superintendent of their church. These people were Bible, Spence was Bible believing, Sabbath observing, teetotaling Christian. And that was what started the labour movement in this nation. That's our heritage. That's our story. That's just one picture of many, many others who impacted people for the person of Jesus around our, nature, our nation. One, tell our stories. And that's what Faith Runs Deep is all about, telling the stories of faith. Secondly, remind people of our shared heritage and values. Remind people of our shared heritage and values. One of the people that became really important to us in a series called uh, Jesus the Game Changer, and we interviewed him in season one, even though what he talks about was more important for season two. And his name was Tom Holland, not the actor in Spider-Man, a different Tom Holland. So Tom Holland was a guy that uh, loved the Greco-Roman world, a student of the Greco-Roman world, wrote books about the Greco-Roman world. That was just his thing. I won't go into any more than that. And then he, he was studying the Greco-Roman world and he suddenly realised that their values and morals, how the Greco-Roman world functioned, we would look at that and would say that is morally abhorrent. The, the sorts of things they did, the way the, the Greeks and the Romans behaved, the way they treated slaves, the way they treated the world was morally abhorrent. They didn't care about the needy. They didn't care about the broken. If you were poor and on your own, you were, on, you were completely on your own. Nobody was going to help you. And he's looking at that and he's comparing that to the Western world today with all the problems in the West and all the problems of, of modern liberal democratic nations. He's like, you know, how come we have this set of values where we value people? We don't always get it right, but we value people. We see people of all, that people have dignity and worth. What happened? And Tom Holland came at that subject, not as a religious person, a Christian or any other spiritual kind of ilk. He came at it as an historian looking at the world going, why are we like we are today? And the answer he came up with? Jesus of Nazareth. That was the answer. And he wrote an, he's written a book called Dominion, 400 pages. He also wrote a book, called, a, a, an article, Why I Changed My Mind on Christianity or Why I Was Wrong About Christianity. Four pages, I'd go to the article. Summarizes his thinking in the article. And at the end of the article, he says this. You know, while the, the, the pews of churches in Western nations are continuing to decrease... We are still influenced, this, is the, this, this bit is me freewheeling, we are influenced by the person of Jesus. And he said, what I've come to realise, that in my morals and my values, I am not Greek or Roman at all, but I am thoroughly and proudly Christian. Now, hear this carefully. He's not saying, I'm a Christian. He's not saying, I believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's not saying, I've given my life to Jesus. He's saying this, my values are deeply influenced by the person of Jesus. Everybody in this country swims in Christian waters. Whether they like to admit it or not, we are deeply steeped in Christian values, which is why we honour sacrifice on Anzac Day, which is why every individual is seen as important. There's so many of our values are deeply influenced by Jesus and we need to remind our nation this idea that we're a great nation, we've, we had a rough start, but we're doing okay today and if we could just get rid of Christians that mess everything up, we'd be so much better off because that's often pushed at us. That is completely false. That is wrong. That is not missing our religiosity. That is missing our history as people. So what we need to do is tell our stories of our nation, remind people of the shared values. But what we also need to do is pass faith on in our communities and in our families. Deuteronomy, a couple of books before Judges. 
Here's what, it, here's what the writer of Deuteronomy says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one God. This is in chapter 6, verse 4. Many of you will know this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you are to be on your hearts. Now, here's verse 7. Listen to this. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them to your foreheads. Write them on your doorposts and of your houses and on your gates. I don't think he actually literally meant walk around with them in boxes on your foreheads, which many Orthodox Jews actually do. What he's saying is these laws are to be on every part of your life and impress them on your children, impress them on your family, pass them on. What happened in Judges chapter 2? What was going on in Judges chapter 2? Why did they forget? Because they were never told. Now, where some of you will be springing to, yep, we've got to get a better program in church to pass on our values. You know whose job it is to pass on the values of the kingdom of God? Every parent, every grandparent, every adult member of a family. And I don't mean, therefore, institute a devotion every day in your family to sit your kids down for half an hour and teach them the Bible. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Let me ask you three questions. Adults in this room, three questions. One, when do your family see you read or study the Bible by yourself? When you're not at church in a small group, or anything, when do they see you read the Bible by yourself? Two, when do they hear you lead in prayer or, or, or pray in a time of crisis? Three, not in your head, when do they see you do that? Three, when does your family hear you talk about your Christian faith and how it impacts your choices? Now, I want to say this to you. Those three questions are diagnostic. They're not to, a to-do list. And they're diagnosing how important Christian faith is to you. If you tell your children or your grandchildren or your family members that Jesus is important to you, but they never see you read the Bible, never hear you pray, pray and never see you discuss your faith with other people, what is, this, what is the summation of how important it is to you? These things are diagnostic. They diagnose how important faith is for you. And if you want to pass on faith, there's a little statement that goes like this. What you do... Shout so loudly, I can't hear a word that you say. So if your words are not reflected in how you live, you won't be impressing anything on anyone bar the thought that you might actually look hypocritical in what you do. Now, all of us are hypocrites. I'm a hypocrite. I don't live out my faith and my life the way I would like to every day. Yet I want it to be reflected in my everyday conversation, language, and actions. And finally, and this relates to that point, be sure of your own faith. You know, we can turn up the church every week. Some of you do that, I was going to say religiously, but that seems odd, doesn't it? Some of you do that all the time. You know, once a month, once every couple of weeks, you might even be here again to do your duty to be at church. Yet is it real to you? Has it Jesus actually impact who you are? Deep down, do you know that you have a relationship with God that is sure and firm and confident for the future? On Thursday night, I told a story that, that is actually in the series, and it's a story my wife tells Jane. Jane's the producer of Olive Tree Media, the creative director of, uh, um, uh, producer of Faith Runs Deep and the creative director of Olive Tree Media. She told this story about growing up through her church, which was a Methodist church, which then became a uniting church. In her late teens, she was at, at her church when there was a visiting speaker who was a kind of evangelist missionary speaker. They had a, a mission week, not a missionary, a missions speaker. They had a week of mission. And she was there when, and her, knowing that her family had been a part of the church. Her oldest two siblings had stopped going. And her dad had been in the church all these years. He'd been a deacon in the church uh, or a church leader. The nine church don't use the word deacon. He was on the sound. He would help around the church. He would be there every week with his family. He was a builder, salt of the earth, wonderful, wonderful guy. But he's just, he was a builder. That's what his, that's what his job was. And he was. And he was your average builder. He was six foot four, 
tall guy, big guy, builder, just your average Australian bloke. Church for years. And the, the guy at the front said, you know, I want to get your, give you an opportunity to get your life right with Jesus. And even though he'd been a leader in the church, a worker in the church, your average Australian builder, Jane, my wife, looked up to see her dad walking down the aisle to stand at the front to give his life to Jesus. Imagine how tough that decision would have been. Ron's now, I believe, with Jesus. But in that moment, he wanted to make his faith sure. And he realized he'd just been turned up the church. It wasn't a personal thing. And that's a nice story, but it comes with a bit of a kicker, doesn't it? What about you? Where do you stand? You've been coming to church, people around you look at you and go, look at you, you're an upstanding, fabulous person. But what about your faith? I want to take a moment not to ask you to come forward like Ron did, remarkable thing, but just to say, here's a chance for you to get your life right with God. Whether you're here or online or in Peel Street, we're all doing the same thing this morning. We're asking about getting our life right with Jesus. So in this moment, I'm going to have a moment of silence and just ask you, do you want to do that? Some of you would have been there on Thursday night. We did the same thing. Those who weren't, I want to give you the opportunity this morning. Is this your chance to get your life right with God? Is this your chance to say, I'm sorry for how I've lived. I want to sort this out. I want to be sure that I'm known by God. I want to be sure that I'm in a relationship with God. I want to be sure that I've asked for forgiveness. I want to be sure that Jesus is a part of my life. I don't want to just be turning up the church and and pretending. I want to know this for me personally. And all of us do this over years. Some some will have a Damascus, Damascus Road experience where they go from radical pagan to follower of Jesus in a moment. Most of us, it's a long process. And you might still be in that process, and if you are, stay with it. You might be at the point where you go, this is my moment. And if it is, why don't you pray with me? So I'm going to ask us to get an attitude of prayer. Closing your eyes doesn't make you more godly or holy. It doesn't help you concentrate. So why don't you join me in prayer? If this is your moment, if God is speaking to you, if you want to get it right with your Heavenly Father, if you know you've messed up and you need to come back, once you do it in this moment. I'm going to pray. Don't pray this out aloud. This is just between you and God. And this is just a form of words to respond to Jesus. Lord, I come to you. I want to say I'm sorry. I want to ask for your forgiveness. I'm sorry for how I've lived. I'm sorry for ignoring you. I'm sorry for how I've behaved. Jesus, come into my life. Give me a fresh start. Fill me with your spirit. And give me the courage to live what I say I believe. Father, we all come to you, not because we've got our lives totally together, but because we need you. And whether we're doing this for the first time or recommitting our lives to you, or whether this is just an opportunity to be reminded of our need for you, Lord, we come to you again this morning. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy in our lives. And we pray that we would experience that and pass it on. Amen. We're going to do a, wrap, a, a feedback form. Even if you did this during the week, you might want to do it again for us. They're on the end of your rows. So the person on the end of the row, can you see those forms that look like this? Pass them along the row. So do that now. That would be great. I know we're very Australian. Somebody says from the front says, do this, and you're all going, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> do, be good. Do, do, the, do this. So you get these, and we're going to get an opportunity to fill them out. And uh, Now, you'll notice there's a smart... There's a code on it. If you've got a smartphone, um, you can actually put your camera on, 
go to the code and it will send you to a little form. So you can do the online form or you can fill it out. And once you do that with me now, I'm going to fill it out with you. So that all the details in the online form you can do in your, in your, uh, on, the, on the, the code on your phone. Now, let me just let you know, really important, you'll notice that this pops up and it'll have Olive Tree Media at the top of the form. We don't harvest any addresses. So no addresses are being harvested. So this, all, all, anything that you put on this form, the only place this comes is back to the leadership of One to One Church. None of it comes to us. We, we'll collect it, then we pass it back to the church, just so that you know that that's the case. So the form says, so we've got actually a couple of different places. Sorry, Peel Street, we, we did this late, so you're not there. But just put, um, put One to One Church, or there's York Street Church. We're doing Peel Street today. Put your name. Mine, mine's fantastic because it does an auto-fill because it does my name. So just whack your name in. And then it's a contact number. Even though they know your contact number, just, um, just put that in as well. I'm talking and doing, trying to put the contact number in the same time, which is always a disaster. Uh, again, put uh, your, your email address in. Again, none of this is harvested by Olive Tree Media. This is all just going back to one-to-one -one church. So there's an opportunity to say whether you found today, uh, how you found this morning. And then there's, if you'd like, uh, I made a response today. So if you made a response today, um, you, you might want to put down, yes, I'm new to faith, or yes, I'm a recommitment. This will, no, just so that the church leadership know how to support you in that. Now, I'd like to talk further to somebody, put down that, if, if you just want to chat further about any of this. Now, here's the, I'd like to join a Faith Runs Deep group. Lots of you have already done, are already ready to do that. But if you think, you know, I'd love to get into a group, no cost. Turn up to a group. There's groups ready to run. Peel Street have got groups ready to run. Here they've got groups ready to run. Why don't you, if you want to join a group, put that down. And then there's the green button at the end that'll put hit submit. And it seems like uh, mine's submitting. So I, uh, there you go. I got it, I got it done. Uh, when I was doing it on Thursday night, I hit submit and they told me I had something wrong with the, and I didn't have time to fix it up. So there was one bad form. So that, that way, you, if you didn't fill it out then, you can take that, uh, that uh, card with you. Remember, just for, this, just for this church. You know, I pray that you're going to pass on faith to your church, your family, your community. It's going to make a difference, not just for now, but for the future of Ballarat, the future of your family, and the future of our nation. Thanks for being with us. Bless you. Thanks, Mark. Amen. Hey, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you that we can share with one to one. Thank you that we can share the message from Carl. We pray that that would continue to speak into our spirit that we're reminded of retelling the stories of our faith. And, Father, I pray a blessing upon our time right now. For those who have got lunch, we pray a blessing and, uh, over that lunch and thank you for that food. And, uh, Lord, again, we look forward to continuing to worship together during that time. Father, would you guide us, protect us, go with us as we go from here, as we continue to be your hands, feet and voice, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless. Thanks for being with us this morning.